Hello, everybody. So um, this is, uh, as promised uh, on last Tuesday, the, the theoretical inner works of the co-localization part. Um, maybe we just get started with, you know, why, why do we do this? And, and then how we do it, and then what is the, the theory behind it, some equations, some easy equations behind it, so that all those numbers that appear in the tables are explained a little bit, and what they mean. Um, this session today is going to, divide, to be divided into two parts. One, um, where I'm going to mainly talk about the intensity-based um, co-localization, which um, in hindsight is a bit of a misnomer as we're not using the localization to find out um, the parts that co-localize. We're using intensity coincidences to find out which pixels co-localize. So it's a little bit of a different approach. We will see the localization approach where um, the distance between two objects or the overlapping of two objects um, are used to figure out whether two things are in close proximity to each other or not. Um, then later in the second part where uh, Doug is going to take over. So the first idea is, is to, to figure out if uh, on a macroscopic scale, if, if a subset of cells in an organism are expressing uh, or are labeled with, with um, with two markers for two different um, proteins, for example. It can be um, GFP and cherry, it can be um, Im immunolabels for a species A or a species B. What we see here is, is, a, is a part of, a, of the embryo development where um, all the red tags stain neurons. So we see here the all neurons are red, and and where the green um, the green pixels in this image can be two things: the dimmer green ones that you see. I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but the dimmer green things that you see on top here that can be ascribed to autofluorescence. But there is a stronger green signal here um, that is um, that is neurons that are in a certain stage of their development. They are stained with polysialic acid. And, and the question here is, of all the neurons, which are the ones that are in this particular stage of development? So those are the ones that are going to be green and red. And if we look at it in an image, they appear in this yellowish tone. So if we do a co-localization by eye, we would go into this image with a little pencil or with the scissors or, or, or with some other kind of marker and we would try to excise the, the pixels that appear in our brains to be yellow and then try to quantify it, you know, the length and the, the quantity, um, how many neurons or how many pixels in total are co-localized versus how many pixels are not co-localized. We will see rapidly what the how to do it, some tools that are available to do that, but we will see also rapidly what are the disadvantages of doing that or what are the pitfalls that we might encounter. Okay, so the first question asked here is, green and red always equal to yellow? It's not bad as a first approximation, but it depends a lot on subjective estimation. It depends on the brightness, it depends on the computer screen brightness, and if we, if we mess around with the brightness and contrast of our display, we sure enough can make any pixel turn yellow as we want. So it's a little bit um, arbitrary um, what we can paint yellow or not. So that's, that's the danger um, of co-localization based on, on the coincidence of two channels. The danger is that, that it can be prone to manipulation and, it's, uh, and, and crosstalk and, and bleed through. So, there, there needs to be some kind of a reliable objective method to go about this. And whenever things start to become reliable and objective, um, 
it's unavoidable to go into some into some math and to find um, some 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 formalism that need to be adhered to in order to um, for all the researchers to be on the same page and to believe that what you're showing is the real deal. Okay, yeah, these were a few um, images uh, to show how your mind can be tricked. This is a, a famous one, is you have you know the two squares A and B in the beginning here and here. Uh, they have the same grayscale value and they only appear dark or bright uh, in our brains due to the context in which they appear. It's because one is in the shadow of the cylinder here, or we interpret um, that this B square here is in the shadow of the cylinder. So we think it's, it's a bright one and A um, is a dark one because it's outside of the shadow. Well, uh, to make a long story short, um, we need some kind of reliable way to quantify this. Um, plunging straight into definition of co-localization, the definitions nowadays can, the definitions for anything can be found in Wikipedia. Um, if we if we go to to the to that site and and ask um, what co-localization is, then it says it refers to the observation of spatial overlap between two or more different fluorescent labels, each having a separate emission wavelength to see if the different targets are located in the same area of the cell or very near to one another. Of course, um, Wikipedia, as reliable as it is, it's omitting a few things. It doesn't necessarily have to be fluorescent labels. Co-localization works actually also using um, transmission images or any other kind of image where um, the question is, are uh, two pixels behaving similarly or do they have uh, uh, um, uh, a hue of, of a color versus another hue of another color and and uh, to distinguish these cases shown down here. So so if I have, um, I have here a bunch of pixels and here I have the situation where green objects occur always in, so the pixel is this larger square here. We cannot um, or we should not be able to um, to be able to resolve the individual circles here. But if we look at the pixels, we have either pixels that contain nothing or pixels that contain both green and red species. If we go to this uh, intermediate case here, the, the case in the middle panel, uh, we will see that the pixels will be either red or green, or in this case, yeah, a little bit of coincidence where we have here at the boundary one that is green and red, but statistically we will have all pixels are either green or red or nothing. Or we might also have a random distribution where we have, you know, all the pixels can be anything. So uh, in an image, this phenomenon can be quantified using a coincidence scatter plot. And this is what, what we all call the co-localization plot. And, and the idea here is to take all these pixels and plot them according to their intensities in the red channel and their green channel. So if I take a pixel like this one here, for example, I would put it here where it has neither intensity in the red nor in the green. If I take this pixel here, I will have one, two, three um, green intensities and two green uh, and two red intensities. I would place it over here. If I have one that only has one red and one green, I would put it over here and so forth. If I take all these pixels, they align somehow along this diagonal line. If they are strictly separated, I will have pixels that are very intensively red um, along this line here. Um, and they will have pixels that are intensively green along this line, but I have very, very few pixels. This one here maybe that has a little bit of green and red, but I will have nowhere a pixel that is bright green and red at the same time. In the random case, I will have a random distribution of pixels around the scatter diagram. Okay. So if we take now an image of a cell taken in, in green and red channels and we plot um, the area corresponding to this um, dark area here, these pixels would be gathered over there near to the origin. If we take um, red, very red objects like the one that, that, that was shown there on the arrow that flashed up, I don't know if you saw it, we would have the, the cloud then developing along the, the y-axis here. If we do the same for the green, they would appear over there. And then we have these brighter cells there in the middle. 
and now we can sort of subdivide this um, the scatter diagram into four quadrants. The one, uh, the one in the, in the lower, close to the orange in the lower left side is where the, the dark pixels are. The one in the quadrant number three, the diagonal, the big area on the top right is where everything that is sort of coincident will be gathered. And then we have the red only and the green only channel on the side. So one, um, one word of caution there is we have to remember that the detection volume is large. In the best case, the detection volume will be, um, well, this is in the, in the best historical case. Now that we have super resolution, we can have it a little bit better than that. But typically, the detection volume um, would be something like 300 nanometers along the plane versus 900 nanometers across the plane. So uh, the positive colocalization means that two fluorescent emission signals come from the same region in space. And it says nothing about the interaction on the molecular level as the intensity and position inside this detection volume may vary. If we look at this um, green asterisk and this red asterisk here in this Di diagrammatically uh, drawn point spread function here, they may be almost a micron apart in space, yet still appear in the same, um, in the same volume. So it's difficult to talk about molecular co-localization when looking at, uh, uh, at this large image, at the, this micrograph. Um, then a major pitfall in co-localization is given by crosstalk. Uh, it is absolutely necessary to acquire crosstalk free images or at least to compensate uh, to to account for the crosstalk and and we also need identical size of detection volumes for different color channels so channel misalignment say if if all my red um, images are three pixels shifted to the left side from my from my from my red image i will get this will this will give rise to um, to artifacts in the in the co-localization or misinterpretations. If we take a look what it looks like, here we have um, two cases, twice the same image acquired once within this so-called sequential mode where you first acquire the red image and then you acquire the green image. This is how the scatter diagram looks like. And here we have the same image with both channels acquired simultaneously. And here we see a hallmark sign for, co -local, for crosstalk and co-localization is the absence of a horizontal line or the absence of a vertical line here in the scatter diagram and a very strong baseline that, um, that, that looks like a diagonal line here. This is the, if you, if you have something like this, like an angle like this without a population down here, this is almost certain to be an artifact due to crosstalk. And, and the workaround for that, or how do I ascertain if I have crosstalk or not, is um, um, there are several ways to go about it. One of them would be, for example, to try to collect it in a sequential mode and see if the histogram changes. If it does, then it was crosstalk. Or um, if possible, or if, if, uh, if if you can afford to do that, go into one region and bleach um, one of the species out and see if in that region this histogram changes. That would be also a proof that you know if I bleached the if I if I bleached the 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 red object and this curve still stays here, then then the intensity is not due to to the red object, but it's the bleed through of the green into the red channel. Okay, so this is this is a very important aspect of this um, of this um, business in co-localization. We see here also maybe it's, it's also worth noting that none of these curves are um, here in this case strictly horizontal. You see that this, it's kind of elevated here. It's it is horizontal, but it's not close to zero. This may be also uh, um, this may also happen. If I have um, strong levels of, uh, of of autofluorescence, of unspecific autofluorescence, or an elevated background that is common to all channels, then I will have a parallel shift um, along the x-axis or the y-axis. Okay.
So in practice, I think we saw this uh, in, in a little bit more detail um, in, in, on the Tuesday session. I will repeat this very, very briefly here so that we um, go back to, to, to interpretation of the table and the mathematical formulas that are uh, given there. Um, in the software, we see, um, we see the image, we see the scatter diagram, and we see this toolbar for the co-localization. We have these quadrants, one, two, three, and we have the image there. And we can select um, regions in the image and plot the diagram. We can select different regions of, uh, of the image and plot different parts of the diagram. Um, we can try to estimate uh, um, which of the areas are the ones that are co-localizing. For example, ask the, 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 the software to paint all these pixels here in the area number three with a specific color, and then um, take all the pixels that are red in this color here. And uh, with this cut mask tool, we can actually cut out the pixels that, that, we, that we want to analyze and refine the analysis later on on these co-localizing pixels. Um, another tool that is kind of interesting is if I have colonies of cells, each one of the cells expressing different levels of, of GFP and YFP. In that case, I will have some kind of a fingerprint situation here where every cell will have their own expressions le expression levels of GFP and YFP. And I can select here um, two different cells that have two different uh, levels of YFP expression. And I can analyze that. So here in and now we come to the to the the colocalization and the data values the the table if i zoom in um we we were not able to do this in the tuesday session because the zoom in does not zoom in the font size of the table but here is a zoomed in version um we have here uh, this table starts with the scatter region one two and three the region number four remember is the one close to the origin it's the non not interesting one so there will be no analysis performed over there uh, what we see here, I will go from left to right um, on the third region, which is the region of um, of co-localization. It counts the number of pixels in there. Um, it counts. Uh, it it con converts this into an area in microns. It puts this area in relation to the whole image. In case I'm not selecting uh, a smaller region of interest, so that's four percent of the area in this case. Um, it calculates the mean intensity. It takes all the pixels, sums them up, and divides them by uh, 41,494 in that case. And the value that comes out here is 89.9. It takes the mean intensity in the, in the other channel, sums them all up, divides by 40, 41,494, and we get 88.4 in this case. Then we can compute the standard deviation of this intensity, i.e. the thickness of the cloud. Uh, the, the variation of the intensities um, is, is in both cases here similar. It's 30 and 31.3 and 33 in the other case. And here we come then to a column that is a little bit uh, more interesting, I'd say, is where we have co-localization coefficients for channel one and channel two. And then we have the weighted co-localization coefficients for channel one and channel two. Then we have um, three important values. One is the overlap coefficient, which is um, should be named the overlap coefficient according to Manders. And then we have a correlation R, which is the Pearson's correlation factor, which is the linear regression and the square um, of that same value there on the right side. Okay, so what are these co-localization coefficients? The co-localization coefficients are defined as follows. I take the number of pixels in channel one that co-localize and put them in relation to the number of pixels of channel one in total. In a, in a pictorial di diagram, I would see here all the pixels in this orange area divided by all the pixels in the red area. That means if I have, of all my pixels that are red, if the majority is in this red um, area here, then the majority of my red pixels co-localize. If the majority of my pixels are in this white part of the, of the, the big um, red rectangle, then this co-localization coefficient is smaller. Um, the value ranges between zero and one. Zero means no pixels co-localize. All of them are in the white part of this uh, rectangle and one is all pixels co-localize. It means they're all in here.
Okay, the same thing can be done weighted, um, weighted by the intensity. And here the difference is I'm not taking the number of pixels, but the intensity of pixels and summing them up in this way. So it's going to sum up all the intensity in co-localization channel and comparing it with the sum of all pixels above threshold here. To give you an example, the mean value or the sum um, of, the, of the red pixels here is corresponding to that value. And in the, in the co-localized um, population, this mean value is larger. So here I will have this mean value is large in comparison to the, to the mean value of the red population. So if I, if I plug these numbers in, um, this um, weighted co-localization coefficient for red will be large and the weighted co-localization for the green will be low, meaning that um, when, when the pixels are co-localized, they will be dimmer in the green channel than in the co-localized um, case. That can be useful if, if there is a dependence in expression levels, for example, between, um, between the GFP and the M-Cherry, for example, if, if, if one is necessary to express the other, um, or if it only expresses when both are positive, or if, or if there is a certain concentration threshold um, uh, necessary for, this, uh, for the co-expression to occur. And then the dynamic behavior of this weighted co-localization coefficient can be kind of interesting to, to monitor. The correlation coefficient, Pearson's correlation coefficient is the covariance divided by the standard deviation. And, and here, this is, this is just the, 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 the linear regression through all the values. I take the difference between channel one and its average, multiply it with the difference of channel two and its average, and I put that in relation to, this, uh, to, the, to the standard deviation that I find there, sort of. Um, the, the value range here is from minus one to plus one, and it describes the cloud that we see, the population cloud that we see in the quadrant number three. And here is a little bit of a word of caution, is it's strictly a linear regression. So all this, all this uh, RP is describing is how similar is this cloud to a diagonal line. In the case um, of, a, of a, a positive diagonal line, this value will be close to one. In the case of a negative diagonal line, the value will be minus one, and it is uh, irrespective of the slope. For a slope of zero, um, this is not defined, um, but it doesn't matter if the if the um, uh, if the slope is is high or low. It will return always a value of one if this cloud is very narrow. So that's the the aim of the linear regression, and the value becomes smaller and smaller as this cloud starts to deviate from a diagonal line. So whenever I have something that is different from a diagonal line, this value will get uh, closer to zero. There are a few special cases down here, and um, there is this interesting case here where we have four different um, points with four different co-localization, individual co -local, clearly co-localized species, but in total, the 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 value will be zero for the linear regression, or I have other kinds of dependencies that may or may not be linear, right? For example, if I have um, uh, the, the, the red species only express after the green reaches a certain threshold, meaning that uh, cells will become very green before they turn red. And when a certain green threshold is passed, only then the cells will become very red or conversely is after a certain threshold of green, then it starts to um, disassemble the, the, the red protein. So curves not necessarily have to be in this linear fashion. Um, just as a word of caution is that this value is not necessarily telling you something about how do things correlate. Um, things correlate clearly here in the cases shown, shown below there, only that they are not linear. Okay, so this is the correlation uh, coefficient over here. And the square of that is on the table to the right. And there is another value here on the left. This is this overlap coefficient. And this overlap coefficient is the overlap coefficient uh, after Manders. There, is, there are a few um, web pages here. This 
Um, this presentation will be made available also on the on the HCBI website. And, 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 and what this does, it is very similar to Pearson's, but it does not subtract the averages here. So we have we don't have negative values and it is insensitive to differences in signal intensity between the two channels. So it's insensitive to photo bleaching or amplifier settings. In a way it's more robust, but then again, um, the value ranges are between zero and one. Again, only indicating is it close to a line or not. Now, it, now we don't know anymore if the line is a, a, a positive slope or a negative slope, but the values will be um, between zero and one here again. Um, if we go into literature and we find, okay, values between 0 and 1.1, between 0, 0.0 and 0 0.1, we do not talk about co-localization in that case. Um, anything above 0.5 to 1 is a strong co-localization. And in between 0.1, there is a, let's say, a, a rather arbitrary um, subdivision between 0.1 and 0.3, where People say this is a weak co-localization in 0.3 to 5, where it is a medium co-localization. Okay, so with that, I think, or I hope we have covered all the mysterious mathematical terms behind um, the co-localization table over there. And I would like to hand over to Doug. Thank you, Chris. Um, maybe while I'm Switching over here, if anyone has a question and wants to throw it out, feel free. Did you figure out a way to do this in batches of images within Zeiss? And actually, does this work in Zeiss Blue, the light software, or do you have to do it on one of the computers attached to a microscope? I have not figured out how to batch it. Um, I, will, I will stay on that case. And, and, and please send me a quick email reminding me to look okay. it up. Yeah. But I have not easily found it. No, I'm sorry. That's okay, thanks. And you can do the co-localization in the, the Zen Light software, right? Right. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, well, as promised on Tuesday, uh, I said I would show you embarrassing data from my grad school days. So I'm actually going to start with a not so embarrassing image. Um, so uh, I guess the first couple slides here are kind of reiterating some of what Chris just said. Um, but I think a lot of the time, whenever people are asking me about co-localization, they're often wanting to use co-localization to show that they have two proteins of interest that are interacting. Um, and so Chris has already gone over this, that like co-localization does not necessarily mean interaction. Um, but here's some work from way back in the day when I was a grad student, we were looking at this membrane protein called RET and whether it interacted with beta catenin. So we started off with this co-localization experiment. And what you can see down here is um, this little area here where the dotted line is, is blown up in panel F. And what we've done here, as far as a co-localization analysis, and follow along closely, because this is very complicated. Basically what happens here is, um, I think this was an ImageJ plugin from way back in the day. Uh, but what it does is you set a threshold for your green channel and your red channel. And what it does is it looks at every pixel and sees if in that pixel, both the green and the red signal are above that threshold. And if they are, it takes the intensity, it takes a mean average of the intensity in the red and the green. So it adds your intensity in green to red divided by two. Um, and then gives you a grayscale image out of that. So basically what you can see here is all these white gray pixels are where there's co-localization. Um, so we said, great, RET and beta catenin co-localize on the cell membrane. Um, but as Chris pointed out, just because they co-localize, it doesn't mean anything. Um, so this is a great figure from a review um, that came out a few years, a couple years ago. This little dot here, um, 
is about the size of a molecule, right? Um, somewhere between one and 10 nanometers, let's say. So if this is the size of a molecule, here's the size of our detection volume in a confocal microscope. So obviously you can fit a whole bunch of those in there and they can be at opposite ends of this detection volume and you won't detect them at all. Um, this diagram also shows a few of the different options that we have in the facility. So obviously we have standard confocal. Um, we've got AERIScan and the AERIScan system. We can do 3D structured illumination. Um, and we can do some, well, we can now do 3D Palm Storm. So down here. So the validity of your co-localization data, um, if you're trying to say that two things are in close proximity together, maybe they're interacting, uh, improves based on the resolution of your microscope. So that's no surprise. And if you want something that's the most convincing, um, you obviously want to go with the best resolution type system. But this still doesn't prove interaction. Unfortunately, in my opinion, the only way to really do, to prove interaction, and this was figure two from that paper that I showed you before, is to do the really hard molecular biology. Um, and to be honest, it's not even that hard. This is just a bunch of immunoprecipitations and GST pull down assays um, that did a good job to show that these two proteins interacted. Okay, so that's it done right. Um, and that was uh, sort of a collaborative project I did with um, one of my colleagues when I was a grad student. But let's look at some of my horrific co-localization work. So this, this was the first co-localization experiment I ever published. Um, and again, we're looking at this membrane protein, RET, and looking at a marker of early endosomes and just seeing if this red protein moved from the membrane into the inside of the cell when you added a ligand to it. Um, so miraculously, we saw yellow when we added this. But if you look at these images, these are <laughs> horrifically overexposed. Um, these are actually off a of confocal, but the pinhole's pretty wide open on these, I think, to get them so bright. Um, so not something that would at all be convincing. And there's absolutely no quantification of this data either in this paper. Um, it's basically just saying, hey, look, we saw some yellow close to the nucleus. A protein must have gotten into the cell. So definitely not the way to do it. Uh, in round two, we got a little more quantitative. Um, so this is, again, looking at um, a membrane prone protein and two cytoplasmic proteins and seeing if they co-localize with lysosomes. Um, and so the, the first panel here is that same, just that sort of average intensity. And then on the far side here is one of these scatter plots. And this is what uh, Chris just took you through. So we're basically looking to see um, what sort of population we have in this quote unquote on co-localized quadrant, the, the yellow quadrant on this diagram. And we did some rough calculations that showed there's a few more pixels here than in either of these other ones. But I think after everything that Chris has just showed you, you probably wouldn't find this overly convincing. Um, now I will say for both of these papers, there's lots of other figures in them that <laughs> did prove things. So <laughs> it's not something that needs to be retracted by any means. But um, when I look back at these, these experiments, it's a, a little painful. So um, when I got to my postdoc days, I, I think I finally got this figured out. And a lot of this has to do with what I was looking at back then. So I was never interested in proving that two proteins interacted with each other. I was always interested in endocytosis. Um, so just asking whether two proteins, two cargos end up in the same place at the same time. And that same place is usually a small vesicle somewhere in the cell. So when you're not so concerned about that interaction, um, co-localization analysis actually becomes really applicable uh, and really easy and really interesting. So ignore panel A here, but in panel B, C, and D, um, 
again, these are just some co-localization analyses with, um, so RAB5, a marker of early endosomes, EA1, which is also a marker of early endosomes, and LAM2, which is a marker of lysosomes. And um, the green stain here is just this cargo that we we're loading, fluorescent cargo that we we're loading into cells. And what we did here was we turned from this idea of looking at co-localization pixel by pixel and looked at it on an object by object basis. So the idea was that we could go into that red channel, find all of those endosomes, localize all of those spots, do the same in the green channel, and then start asking, okay, I've got a whole bunch of X, Y coordinates. Do any of these match up in between the um, two different channels? And this turned out to be a fantastic way to co -local to do co-localization. We got really good, really meaningful data, and we were able to show that when this cargo starts into a cell, it co-localizes very strongly with early endosomes. And then when you get to later time points, it's transitioned out of those. Um, and then again, if you look at those later time points, it's transitioned out of the early endosomes because it's showing up in the lysosomes. Um, so in my opinion, this is a great way to do co-localization analysis on an object basis instead of on a pixel by pixel basis. And it does have some other applications outside of just uh, vesicles or endocytosis. Um, so this is um, a paper out of Beth Stevens' lab and then a follow-up little methods paper on how we actually did this. And this was looking at um, synapses. So basically, we had um, markers for presynaptic and postsynaptic uh, markers. And this was done with structured illumination data off of our old Elira system. And again, all you're doing is finding all the presynaptic markers in green, all the postsynaptic markers in red, and then saying, um, how far apart are these from each other? And what they're able to see is that in their wild type mice, they have um, lots of these uh, presynaptic and postsynaptic markers um, in close proximity to one another. But when you do this with uh, a mutant mouse, you see a decrease in it. And if you looked at this just with standard confocal, everything just looked yellow. So it really did need the, the extra resolution. So how do we actually do this? Um, so in the, the endocytosis paper I showed you before, we did it with some custom MATLAB code. Um, in the Stevens lab, they've been doing it with Ameris with, I think, a little bit of um, custom MATLAB code burned into it as well. Um, today, what I want to show you is something that I've been working on the last few days, um, a little custom macro to do this in Fiji ImageJ. So what I'm going to do is just start with this sort of simulated data here. We've got a bunch of uh, green spots, a bunch of magenta spots, and you can see some of these are green only, some of them are magenta only, and then the others so some degree of overlap between them. And so basically all we're going to do here is um, run a little function, it's a built-in function in image J called find maxima, and what it's going to do is it's going to find the centroid of all of these points, in both the green channel and the magenta channel, it's going to give us a readout of all those points. And then we're just going to compare these to each other um, to see if any of these are in proximity to one another. Cool. So I'm going to show you how this actually works in image J here now. Okay, so um, I've got that little figure right here. Here's my macro. Um, I'm just going to run this first of all, just to show you kind of how easy this is. Um, so when you hit run, what pops up is it asks you where all of your files are um, that you want to run this on. So I'm just going to do the simulated data folder. There's only the one file in there. So we're going to hit select. And then what it does is it asks you for this tolerance prominence cutoff. So this is kind of like a threshold. And I'll show you this a little bit better on the real data instead of the simulated data, uh, because the simulated data here is either 
uh, saturated pixel or unsaturated. It doesn't really matter what you set this to. Um, you can set it for different uh, values for each channel, depending on how bright or dim your channel is. And then what's important here is this co-localization cutoff value. Uh, so this is done in pixels. So this is basically how many pixels apart those centroids can be, where you will still call them as overlapping with one another. Um, so I'm just going to put in something like 10 pixels here. And we'll let this run. And it's going to go. And here's what we get in the end. Um, so we get two things. We get our log window that tells us what happened. And then we also get um, a results table. Oh, sorry, there's actually two files in that folder. Good. Uh, so what it does is it, it processed both files. So it started out on this first one that's called lots of green. Um, so that's just one that I, I put in. There's more of the green only uh, dots than there are of the uh, co-localized or magenta dots. So it's found 25 objects in the green channel, 15 in the magenta channel. And then based on that cutoff, we gave it 8% um, of the green objects are co-localizing with the magenta ones and 13% of the magenta ones are co-localizing with the, the green ones, which makes sense because we had more of these to begin with. Um, the second file here is this one that you saw before. And again, it's gone through, it's found 12 of each color and the co-localization percentages are, are gonna be the same because um, we've got the same number of free ones here. And if we change that cutoff value, obviously these, these numbers would change because we have some of these that are right on top of each other where we've got other ones that are pretty far away from each other. Um, cool. So what ends up kind of being the most important aspect of this is um, oops, is setting this original threshold or tolerance or prominence value is what it's called. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take this image and split it into the two different channels. And it's actually pretty easy to set it on this green channel. So if we go into the process menu, there's something here called find maxima. And if we click on that, um, this is now called prominence in newer versions of Fiji MSJ and older versions, it was called the tolerance. And basically what this is, is if you have a pixel, what it's gonna do is it's gonna look around that pixel and it's gonna, it's not just gonna look immediately, it's gonna um, kind of go out as like a watershed from there. And it's going to say, at some point, do I have a surround that is, in this case, 10 intensity values lower? Um, and it has to completely surround that pixel. And if it does find that somewhere, it's going to call that a maxima. So um, obviously, this data is really clean, so it looks pretty good. If we increase this number, we should get fewer. And if we decrease this, we're going to get more. Um, so it turns out that 10 is actually pretty good for this data set. Right. But if we go to this red one, this red, you might not be able to see it on your screen, but there's a lot more noise in this image and um, the intensities aren't quite as bright as the green channel. So if we go in here and we do the same thing, set that prominence value to 10, <laughs> it's a total mess. Um, and you can see this image has actually been uh, played around with and the background's been, something's been cut out of the image down at the bottom here. Um, so what this means is that it's very important to go in and check both channels first to figure out what sort of prominence value you need. Uh, so it turns out in this one, a lot of prominence value of 100 um, is pretty good. Okay, so then after that, it's just exactly the same thing. So uh, I have to put this image back.
So we're just going to run this again. Um, in this case, the red channel is actually channel one. And so we'll set that to 100, set our other one to green. Um, oh, and this is something I meant to talk about too, is how do you actually figure out what this um, cutoff should be? So um, what I like to do for this is take a look at one of these endosomes, just or in this case, it's endosomes, but whatever you're looking at, and just take a look at what the size of that object actually is. Um, so in this case, it looks like we're about four or five pixels across. So I'm going to set that as my cutoff. I'm going to set it to five. Okay. And we'll hit go. Uh -oh. Some reason it doesn't like my image. I think the threshold on the red was ten. Um, I think you're right. So pointing it to the right folder. There we go. It was just pointing to the wrong folder. All right. So now um, we've got 80% of our objects in the red channel are co-localizing with the green ones and 32 percent or 33 percent vice versa so um yeah i think this is a a good and simple way um for analyzing co-localization just based on objects uh, and so if you can get away from the pixel by pixel co-localization if if your particular biological system allows for it um, I feel this is a little better way to do it. Great. So that's all I wanted to share today. And um, I'd definitely be happy. If you've got any questions for myself or Chris, please feel free to fire away. And I will end the recording.